If you're tired of struggling in your love life and you want a proven system to get into and maintain a relationship where you're consistently loved, valued, and cherished, go to forever1234.com. Again, that's forever1234.com. Welcome to the Master Your Magnetism podcast, where I bring on top experts to help you shift your vibe so you can create the life and relationship you've always wanted. Today, I'm talking with the one and only world famous Rory Ray, an amazing relationship expert and coach. So welcome, Rory. Thanks for joining me for a live broadcast today. Oh, Helena, it's so wonderful. I love being with you. And hi to everybody who's here. We're broadcasting this live, so say hi in the chat. Let us know any questions you have. Today, we're talking about something really interesting. We're going to be sharing what a man needs to feel and not feel in order to truly believe that you're the one. I've interviewed other experts on this topic, but what we're going to share today is going to be something you've probably never heard before. Rory has some brand new information that we wanted to share. So, Rory, I'm so excited to dive into this topic. What's the first thing you have to say about what makes a man? see you as that one special woman he just never wants to live without. All right. Well, (laughs) normally I would talk about all the different qualities of being vulnerable, being open. He needs to feel that he is your hero and that he's doing right and not wrong and that he, he feels accepted as who he is, all those important things. But today I thought, let's do something really outrageous and really true. So the first feeling he needs to have in order to know that you're the one is that the feeling that you are not his mother. Mm. Not only are you not his mother, but you are not like his mother. A million questions are popping into my mind. (laughs) You hear that thing that, you know, men end up marrying someone who's sort of like their mother on a certain level, right? And you're saying that you have to not be like his mother. So I would love to dive deeper into this. And if anyone has questions, let us know in the chat. Well, maybe I should open up the second. I have three points here. The first point is the feeling that you are not his mother or not anything like his mother. So let's say that is a feeling that he is conscious of and he's conscious of why he feels that way. He is conscious that you did something that made him feel like you're his mom. He's usually even a very unaware man is aware of that thought. So number two is he needs to feel that you're exactly like the best parts of his mother. Wow. Yes, outrageous. Only this part is subconscious for him. He he so disavows consciously anything about you being like his mother. It makes it turns him off sexually. It makes him feel afraid. It makes him feel bossed. But the subconscious elements of your likeness to his mother could be a smell, pheromones. It could be something you, a color you wear, that he, if he was conscious of it, would go, oh, that reminds me of my mother. But subconsciously, it opens up a feeling in him of love and being cared for. And if he was poorly treated by his mother, which is very common, actually, he is going to feel not the bossed around, push around feelings, because those are point number one. He's conscious of those. He is going to feel the part where he felt loved, even if it was painful. He's going to feel that subconsciously. Now, this accounts to why men that you know of who seem totally normal and awesome stick with women who are really wretched to them, who treat them very, very, very badly and uh, are bitchy in the the way that we women call bitchy and nasty. And we go, what is he doing with her? That is a subconscious att- uh, a- attraction, yes, and attachment he has to that mothering thing that he remembers. And he calls it subconsciously being cared for, being loved. Consciously, He doesn't feel that at all. So we have an inner battle. And I know we call this a wounded masculine. We call this a man who is, has issues. 
<laughs> but almost all of us have these two dichotomies, go, these things going on, this dichotomy that we feel the same about men. We want a man who is nothing like our father, but because that would be sexually weird, right? Yeah. But we want a man who feels like the best of our father. And that is more subconscious. Some of it are very aware that we want to be held like father held us. Men feel it a little bit differently. You know, we're a little more loosey goosey. They are very, uh, very aware of this being turned offness when we start being bossy. When we start over functioning, when we start putting sandwiches in front of them, <laughs> not in the way he likes, but like, oh, do you need to eat? Whatever it was about his life with his mom that made him run, he's going to run from you. So the, the third point would be everything else, everything else that I've ever talked about is modern siren, which is, <clears throat> I think, what I started with. Um, him feeling heroic in your presence, him feeling accepted completely. And men feel terrible about themselves. They feel terrible about their sexuality. So when you are accepting of that and of all parts of his body, he is just in heaven. And so we can start anywhere you want. I could just talk to you forever about all of these. And I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this before. So I love just having brand new things to share with my community here. The first thing I want to talk about is the first point, right? How to not be like his mother. I know I get questions all the time from women in my community who say, how do I stop mothering a man? <laughs> like they know consciously that they're not supposed to do that, but there's just something in them that like can't help it. Right. Um, yeah. Have you experienced that yourself or what would you have to say for someone who tends to overfunction or mother a man? Well, of course I experienced it. So I think maybe sharing my story might be helpful. I mean, I know theoretically everything, right? I mean, I know when I am doing things that are pushing him away, right? So why do I do it? Because subconsciously, I want to push him away. Mm. Now, that is my conscious self knowing that overfunctioning. you know, I've been reading Rory Ray. I go back over my own stuff. And I know that I'm pushing my husband away if I after he's made a decision, if I ask him to revisit that decision without doing it correct, doing it in a, in a way where he is aware that I am aware that I'm revisiting it. But most of the time, we just keep pushing it. The word is push. So as soon as we push by um, bringing up something that was already settled, but bringing it up sort of from the middle, like, oh, I was thinking, what if this? We're pushing. And of course, that is automatically masculine energy. A push is masculine energy. A pull feeling is feminine energy. Lean back and pull. You're in feminine energy and you magnetize him. If you are pushing, you're literally pushing him away from masculine energy. So first of all, you can notice where your body is. When I'm leaning, feel myself, my body leaning forward and wanting to say something to him, automatically, I know. I'm in masculine energy. I'm pushing. So I make myself lean back and automatically standing back, taking a couple steps back, I can tell what's going on with me. And what is going on with me is something deeper than wanting a different outcome with him. So I can tell that I have something unresolved inside me that somehow I believe on some subconscious old pattern level is going to be fixed if I bring this up with him again. It is totally wrong, right? Not going to happen. And I've done this oh, thousands and thousands and thousands of time, right? You've done this thousands and thousands of time, yeah. and times, oh, yeah. every one of you out there, and we still don't learn. Why? Because we do on a deep subconscious, subconscious level, want to push him away. It is such a powerful fear of intimacy thing and is so below our consciousness level. All we know instead is that we are trying to fix something. And the feeling is, I've got to fix this. I have to apologize. I have to suggest something else. I have to fix whatever I did before. I have to ask him again. And we completely go above the whole level of what it is we are 
looking for. So I, I ask myself, and I want you to ask yourself, am I feeling lonely? Am I looking for connection? Am I just trying to say something to him that's going to make him reach out to me? And as soon as I ask myself that question, I go, hmm, all right, well, what would work better then? What is more truthful? More truthful is, wow, I'm missing you. I'm feeling lonely. I haven't talked to you since last night. Things are going on with me. I need some conversation. Yeah, instead of trying to bring up an old conversation. So that's the first thing I do. And the first thing that I become aware of. And then I ask myself, well, am I angry? And that is really crucial. If I am angry, and perhaps you're like me or unlike me, and you're uncomfortable with that anger on a deep level, then you're going to do everything you possibly can to cover that up. And the first solution to not expressing anger, and you'll you'll notice it if you do a cranky thing, you know, I'm no, starting to notice my my brain going, oh, why did he do that wrong? Oh, he did that. I'm noticing me judging him. That is the first sign of cranky in me. And I love that word because it mm -hmm. kind of shows the switch between really getting in touch with, I'm feeling lonely. I'm feeling unhappy. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling scared of something. And I'm hoping he will help me. But instead of saying that, I'm doing the push. So instead, I get back in. I go, what's What's on my mind? I'm feeling this. I'm feeling that. But let's say he's not in a space to like be my help or my therapist or my listener at that moment. He's doing something. So I automatically think the way to insert myself is to talk about something else, something that he is talking about. And all of a sudden becomes not only a push, it becomes a strategy. And I'm trying to get his attention to solve something that's way deeper. So I just keep moving backwards and I go, wow. I'm working on all this stuff, and some of it is trauma. Some of it is uh, being triggered and brought up by something he did yesterday or two minutes ago. And I'm trying to be some reasonable masculine person, trying to get him to interact with me, instead of saying, whoa, right now does not feel like a good time to get help from him but I certainly can say something to him, right? I can say, sweetie, I can feel myself feeling kind of down, feeling something weird and wanting to have a conversation. Could we talk later? He will automatically stop in his tracks, look at me, go, honey, of course, I'm not, I don't have the space to hear you right now. Can we talk when I get back or this, that, the other? I go, yes. And immediately I feel heard. So let's, let's just say then, and better. And then I work on it myself, but I am not ignored by him and I no longer need his attention in those old ways. So this is kind of big uh, as my drift kind of getting to you. Absolutely. Oh yeah. To me, it feels like one is just trying to do stuff to like get some kind of immediate need uh, met, <laughs> which obviously doesn't work. Anyone who's ever tried that. The other is getting in touch with what you actually want, which is to feel heard, to connect, to feel loved or understood in that moment. And so how to go about doing that in a way that actually works, I think is what you just described there. So that was brilliant. I love that. Well, thank you. And the fact that I need to go through that all the time tells you that it's not necessarily something that you fix forever. But what you can fix very quickly is what I call the catch, which is catching myself, doing the, the higher above the neck masculine thing of trying to find a strategic way to insert myself into controlling the situation and he's gotten the conversation and thereby getting attention, even if it's bad attention. Instead, I'm going way down into my pelvis, taking my, my hand all the way down my body. I can feel the energy relaxing, and I don't like that word relaxing. I can feel it dropping. I can feel the energy dropping into my body, and I stop for a moment. That moment, and I take a deep breath, right into the deepest belly I've got, and I can feel everything dropping more and more and more and more and more. And then it's like that original strategy that I was going to try, that pattern, it just goes away. It just fades. I have no more interest in it. It's like 
I moved from one space to another. I was in a high mental masculine place and I thought that thought would work. And then all of a sudden I fell into peace and I say peace, but actually it's usually a very painful feeling place. The reason why we jump to push at him is because we're feeling uncomfortable and sad and we're trying to get over that. Well, the secret, as you all know, is just feel it. Just yeah. feel that sad, feel that real fear, feel it moving through you. And at different times in your life, different ages, different experiences, different hormones, different moods, different food interactions, you are going to have different feelings. Some things bring up more fear than others. Some bring a feeling of, wow, I can do anything. So I also try to catch and create a log almost of what creates good feeling feelings for me and a, a kind of a bottom up feeling of strength. And this I think is a lifetime, lifelong experience for you. This is a tool to use over life and we probably should do a major workshop, a major mastermind on just this, keeping a log of how do I feel better when I'm feeling into old, sad, horrific, fear-based feelings. What is, what is, what is it? And what can I do to fix that? But in the meantime, you don't want to act that out with your man. You want to stay with yourself and just back up, smile at him. That's all you need to do. And if you get used to doing that, you will never ever be like his mother to him <laughs> because his, that's what his mother did. His mother, remember mother, was terrified for him every moment. She was afraid if he didn't eat, you know, he would die. And so she put food in front of him in a very like, you're gonna die if you don't eat this. I know best. She pushed it on him. If, if she was afraid he was gonna show up ill-dressed and people were gonna think badly of her and of him. So she watched everything he, he uh, dressed in, all his shoes. She, she wanted to make sure he was this, he was that. That is the signal of the mothering instinct and not the good mothering instinct, which is, I love you. Everything you do is brilliant. Yes, I can feel the difference. I can feel it in myself when you want to say, oh, be careful. You know, <laughs> it was really windy here the other night, which is unusual for where we live. And I felt the need to say, oh, be careful driving home, you know, <laughs> just can't help myself sometimes. And I think we all do this. Uh, we have some great questions in the chat, Rory. Do you want to get to some of these before yes, moving on to absolutely. the next point? Absolutely. By the way, you mentioned workshops. Speaking of workshops, if you're listening live on Bullhorn right now on the screen, you'll see a beautiful picture of Rory and a link to her feminine energy workshop where you can work personally with her trained coaches, right? It happens once a month, but you can just join them one at a time for only $17. Do you want to say anything about that, Rory? Oh, that's very sweet. It is such an awesome experience that the same women that started in the first one keep coming. So I'm probably going to have a season ticket for you with that includes the replays so that, you know, it's wonderful. But the the coaches that run this, the hosts are no slouches. They're already the social media stars like Naomi Thompson, Beth Ellen, uh, Lillian Toscano. There are breakout rooms. There's uh, what Naomi and Beth do at the top uh, is amazing. They take you through stuff and we all kind of sit around. I'm always there. I just sit in the bleachers and put a blanket us over ourselves. And it's just a deep dive and a deep swim with sirens. And it's just, it makes you feel good. Not just the whole rest of the day. Sometimes it lasts a whole week for women. So we do it the last Sunday of every month and we're going to keep the price at this low price. So it's like, I, I keep saying like going to church, putting the money in the basket, going to lunch. <laughs> and yeah, I love it. So. I love it. And it's just a one-time payment if you want to just show up once. It's not a recurring monthly. Billing. No, there's no right. subscription. You just show right. up, you show up and we do, a, it's a different concept every time. So like this one is the feminine mystique. We've done the feminine dream, the feminine, we, we're really focusing on certain things and they're going to be a whole new like tools and guided walking you through these amazing tools from the top. Naomi did something a few, few months back called uh, looking through different lenses and it was just insanely good. It was so good. And you have the replay, by the way. 
Yeah, the next one's on Feminine Mystique. Amazing. So if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you're listening to the replay of this, I'll include that as the first link in the description or episode details. So, oh my goodness, so many amazing comments and questions. I don't know if you can see these, Rory. Kelly has a great question. She says, what if you don't know his mother? And then she said his mother passed away. He said he was closer to his grandmother, but I don't know either because they both passed away years ago. Any thoughts on that? I thought that was a fantastic question. What a brilliant question. Thank you so much. Well, abandonment is a huge wound that we all have. When a parent dies, that is, you know, a million times worse. You Mm -hmm. will never be able to guess what a man feels about his mother until you know him really, really well. And even then, so what you want to do is just the general concept of the push is what you want to soften in yourself and taking Helena's be careful driving home (laughs) the way Helena said it, I'm sure conveyed. I feel afraid. I I love you so much that I feel like tying a a rope to your chest and keeping you in view your whole life. That is something you can say to a man. I feel this need to not just cling to you, but wrap you in saran wrap and preserve you. And then you both laugh at it. And then so I'm saying all I know to say is be careful out there. And that is a way when you express that you know, your vibe and you actually express what it is you're feeling, which is just terrified of, you know, being without him, all of a sudden you become stronger. He sees you as not a person who's so afraid of abandonment that he has to take care of you, can't go anywhere, that just completely, you know, wrecks, you know, his whole feeling about you. Whereas if you express how afraid you are, he's just, wow, how cool is that? And And the fact that you were brave enough to say that to me, which is pretty unattractive to, we would think is pretty unattractive, right? But hell, he loves it. Totally attractive to when you, when you fess up, when you own it, when you're, when you transparent. So you see what you need to do first is step back. And before you say, be careful, you have to say, I am feeling afraid that I'm going to be abandoned by him. That's what's happening. So you're saying, don't abandon me. He, you're thinking that you're saying it like, I really care about you and I want you to feel safe, which is what mother said. I want you to be safe. I care about you. That is, that is the words and the bearing and the pushing and the surrounding, right? You can imagine what that feels like. I want you to be safe is a forward leaning, you can feel I'm leaning into the microphone, a surrounding kind of feeling that feels like mom to him. All moms, unless his mom never, ever, ever said anything that he cared about. And you know what? It doesn't matter because you're going to start picking up on that as you get to know him, which is a whole nother podcast here of how to pick up on who he is and and what he needs and what happened to him and what makes him feel good and what makes him feel triggered and bad. But in a general sense, that surrounding him and a mother who didn't care about him might have actually surrounded him because she cared about how he represented her. Maybe she cared about how she looked to her friends. And so she wanted him to behave correctly. Whereas another mother might have I want you to have a good time here. So do this, behave correctly. It's again, where you're coming from. So what we're talking about is where are you coming from? Are you coming from the, I'm surrounding you because I don't want you to abandon me because I'm lonely and miserable? Or are you surrounding him because, oh my God, I'm so afraid something's gonna happen to you, which is still, and then you're gonna abandon me. You cannot get away from the, you're going to abandon me. So what you need to do is say that. I'm so, I'm still so feeling so uh, 
so emotional about the idea of even walking across the room from me, much less getting into a car and going somewhere. I must have picked that up from my family and my fears. And I don't want to dump that on you, but I wanted to share. Okay, so sometimes if it's going out the door, you cannot share that at that moment. It's not the right moment, right? You can't have a deep talk. But later on, you can. And as you start being with a man and you start sharing your transparency with him, it's going to become a joke. It's going to become sweet. You won't have to do it anymore because you've already shared the core feeling you have and not the, oh, just, you know, I'm surrounding you feeling. I know this is big what I'm talking about, but was it clear? It makes so much sense to me. It's like crystal clear. I mean, you should hear some of the things I tell my husband sometimes like, oh my gosh, I'm just feeling so needy today. I just feel like I need so much extra reassurance. And he loves that, right? Rather than me stuffing that down and trying to not act needy. It's like owning that emotion and expressing it. And just like you said, we laugh about it. And he's like, oh, come here. I want to be the one to <laughs> make you feel better or to meet your needs. Not that I do that every day, but when I'm feeling more needy than usual, you know, once every few months, absolutely. I feel totally comfortable expressing that. And he loves it. So I, I totally get what you're saying. Well, I like hearing your story. Does, yeah. he, does he, do you feel the need to say, I need a hug? Or does he instinctively move toward you? Instinctively, he comes right towards me as soon as I express how I feel every time. Yeah. I mean, what you say is just pure gold. There's <laughs> it works every time. So I encourage everyone to try that. Um, Kelly says, yes, I absolutely see abandonment it makes me feel like he doesn't want to get close to me. So he doesn't have to feel abandoned again. That's huge. She's the one with the question about the man whose mother passed away. Exactly. And, yeah. So that's the conversation you want to have, which is, I'm so sorry. How do you feel when I go to the market? You know, what, what do you need from me? And he will likely tell you. And you say back, you know, I feel needy. I feel afraid of being abandoned by you too. We both got this. And then you have a fellow feeling, you know, now you're in a sanctuary relationship where you were both concerned with uh, keeping each other safe. Now you're talking about safety together. That is huge. And I, I love what Helena said that I thought I caught something here that I thought might be really interesting. Helena, your guy, when you just say, I feel needy, he goes, oh, and he immediately steps in yes. and hugs you. That's like his cue. Whereas a lot of the women that I hear from, they say, I'm feeling needy and lonely right now. And he stands there and then they feel the need to say, can I please have a hug? And then he goes, okay, I got an instruction and he comes over. So now we're down to which kind of man do you want? And can you train the second one to be like the first? Can you train the one where you have to actually give an instruction to where he actually initiates some kind of solution? And don't we all love men who initiate some kind of solution? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, so there we go. So you have no way of knowing until you actually share the depth. And I am feeling uh, this sense right now that the way most women feel is that they're never going to get the guy to initiate what you just described your husband initiates and what my husband at least 80% of the time does. If I just say it and I feel into it genuinely, I'm not smiling and trying to be cute about it. Right. Like, oh, I'm feeling really needy right now, but I really go, <laughs> you know, I can feel it through my whole body. I'm feeling needy and I keep wanting to grab onto you he will instinctively move in because I, I moved, I, I leaned back, I shared, he moves in to, to fill the void. He can feel the instruction in his bones. However, we as women and most of the women I hear from are automatically afraid that he's never going to instinctively move in, row the boat, hug you. And so we feel the need to go, you know, I feel needy with a smile and could I have a hug? And then he gets instructed and that's better than nothing. But what we really want to do, I guess, in our podcast here is go deep, which is, hey, you've gone, you have to be the one to drop the whole guard. You got to drop the smile. You got to drop the, I'm okay here. I'm strong. I'm strong. I'm okay. You don't have to worry about me, but mm -hmm. I do feel a little needy. 
you got to drop the whole thing and you got to go, whoa, I can feel this in my gut. I almost feel like crying. I like to say that a lot when I feel it. Wow, I feel like almost like crying. And I, by the way, was trained not to cry. So I, I, yeah. I don't know if I'm unusual like that, but I still have that block. I can feel that if I just had a good cry, I would feel so much better. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll watch animal videos on YouTube <laughs> or or I go out into nature and I find something that moves me in order to actually feel that because I was taught you cry, nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> nothing happens. The parent says, you know, defends themselves against whatever made you cry. Unless it was a kid down the street who made you cry, then it's okay. Yeah. But generally... I, yeah. Saying I feel like crying, a man's going to feel guilty, right? But that's not why you're crying. You're crying because you felt abandoned at a moment. You felt this, you felt that. And I think this is a really great way to tell if this man is a good partner for you. You know, men who are so wounded that they think of their own selves before they think of you. I'm not sure that's a good bet. I think that's a really good thing to learn right away. You need to learn about you when you can you expose your need for safety so honestly and so deeply that you also care about his needs for safety at the same time, then you want a partner who can do at least as well as you do in that department. And then you create a, a sanctuary relationship where you both are concerned with keeping each other safe and not just yourself safe. I really believe that we are get very protective and not need to keep ourselves safe because we do not trust the men we're with to care about, really care whether or not we are safe. So let's start choosing men who actually do care whether or not we feel safe in their presence. And the only way to test that is to give them a, a chance, is to start exposing the real stuff and see. And then, yeah, we got to walk away from those other guys because I don't know if you can train a guy who is essentially self-absorbed. I totally agree. I love the idea of just being wide open, transparent, your most authentic self right from the start to see what a guy's got, to see if he could really be a true partner. You mentioned sanctuary relationship. If anyone's curious about that, we did a whole podcast episode on that. That is posted on Spotify and Apple. It's called How to Draw Him In Like a Magnet with Your Feminine Energy So He'll Want to Stay Forever. That is my top viewed podcast of all time, Rory. So <laughs> everyone absolutely loved that. I see some great comments in the chat. Jessica said, Rory, you're amazing. I had a major aha moment. The need or urge to make something happen is a cover for wanting to avoid the intimacy. She says, this is a totally different way of being. And she asked, is it possible for a man to bypass his wounds and find a good female match even when he hasn't healed his old mother-son patterns? What a great question. What are your thoughts on that, Rory? Absolutely. Just like you are. Oh, I just got to chill. Mm -hmm. Think about you. You've been through hell. All women have. The younger you are, perhaps the different your experience. But we have all been taught to suit up and be men and hide our feelings. And when we try to move into the workplace in a, in a sense of equality, feminism, we basically increase that suiting up quality. And that's why a lot of the early feminists are saying very odd things, have said odd things. I think Candace Bergen said she'd throw her mother down the stairs in a wheelchair for a good man. Hmm. That, I mean, that's not very appealing, but she was really saying how the suiting up, caretaking thing that feminism gave us, and I'm an old time feminist, really made us in the same way that the men are. So we have to start. We have to start. So we have to open up and absolutely get into this fear we have of sharing our real self because we think this guy we're attracted to is going to run away. And we have to be prepared. If he runs away, good riddance. Yeah. Now, if he's wounded, all he needs is if he has the potential to heal, you're not going to heal him by making him feel better. This is really important. 
giving him the space and letting and telling him how you feel, listening to him when he's upset. That is not going to help. What is going to help is when you learn how to dig deep, because that's just covering up your own self, right? And focusing on him. Instead, you want to focus on you. You want to get into it. You want to find the feelings. You want to feel the horrid feelings. It's not fun. But once you get the hang of it, they start to fade much more quickly. Now you get past your wounds by hugging yourself, by loving these feelings, by falling in love with these parts of yourself that are judgmental and angry and pushy and all those things you need to fall in love with them. That's really important. All the parts of you that suit up and hide yourself, you have to fall in love with those as much as the weaker, vulnerable parts. And then when you start to do that in his presence, you are basically saying to him, I am trusting you with this information. I just got a chill. Yeah. I, my hand just went, I'm handing this to you for my hand. I am showing you this part of me. I am trusting you. And you do it in the most genuine way you can. Of course, coaching helps so much. You do it in front of a coach and she gives you the feedback of, yeah, that felt this way to me. That felt authentic and this is what I felt. And you just keep doing it until you get down to rock bottom and you let it go. Then he goes, whoa, not only is she brave, hugely brave she trusts me and he can feel that whoa she showed herself to me wow that's amazing okay well i'm going to try and then he will open up but not in a oh snivelly this makes me feel bad this makes me feel bad he's going to open up by going wow and leaning forward and putting his arms out and saying I can hold the space for you to feel this because you trusted me. That is what he can do. And how you behave in that moment is either going to make him feel like this was a good move or a bad move. So you go, you want to push and go, oh, do you feel the same way? Is this happening to you? No, 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 no. You want to go, wow, this feels so good. Thank you so much. Wow, please, I love this feeling when you're touching my shoulders and I could just let go and you accept me. Wow, you're amazing. And you just say that, which is true in the moment, correct? And all of a sudden, his looks are not important, right? All of a sudden, his money isn't important. All of a sudden, the fact that he's capable of seeing you and hearing you in a really scary, painful moment and lean forward even a little bit and put his arms around you and not pretend and not get all patting you on the back and go, it's okay, it's okay. He's moved past his wounds and you just keep doing that and he keeps getting better and better and better at it. He starts to feel stronger. I hope that answered the question. That was so good. Jessica wrote back in. She said, this is gold. So that was very helpful. She said, that's so beautiful. I got teared up. Thank you, Rory. So thank you for the question. That was a, such a great question. Yeah. You mentioned that a man also needs to feel like you're the best parts of his mother. And I've never really heard anyone say that before in that way. So I would love to hear any thoughts you have on that too, Rory. Well, I've seen a lot of those reality shows over the years, ones on pheromones where they uh, had uh, your parents put on sweatshirts or little t-shirts and then take them off. And then they dressed a man coming from behind a booth in the different shirts. And we always were attracted to the one that our father wore. Hmm, it's wow. a pheromone thing. And because, because we didn't know. If we'd known, we would have veered away from that, but we didn't know. And he, we can't help it. We are part of our genetic family. You are part of your mother and your father and your experience in your life of needing love as a child was met sometimes by pain, sometimes by narcissism. It was met in all different kinds of ways. But that to us is love. And so we feel it on a subconscious level. Consciously, we now know if a man is narcissistic. And by the way, no, I do not think you can heal a clinically narcissistic man 
or a narcissistic conversationalist, which is for another conversation, heal them past their wounds in the manner I talk about before. I think a clinically, a clinically narcissistic person needs to really want to get some serious help themselves. You are not. You're not going to get what you want if you behave as someone's therapist, but you are going to get what you want if you behave coach-like, which is what we were talking about, which is that felt amazing. You are amazing. I hear you. That is coach-like. That is healing. So if a man comes and sees you, he sees a woman who does not look like his mother. He sees different color hair. He sees different color eyes. He wants to see a sexy woman, not his mother. He wants to see leg. He doesn't want to see the legs of his mother, right? He wants to see boobs. He wants to see breasts. He doesn't want his mother in there at all. <laughs> Got that? But subconsciously, he still wants the breast. Subconsciously, he wants to hear a voice that sounds like his mother. Subconsciously, he wants to hear the same tone of voice subconsciously. And these things are at war in him, right? He wants to hear a woman yell at him. He wants, he, he wants to hear be yelled at. How many men have you seen who uh, live with men, women who yell at them? How many women have you seen who live with men who treat them badly, who hit them, who tell them they're doing something wrong every 10 seconds? That is because of the subconscious connection with bad parenting, with the parent you had. Now, I'm sure a therapist is going to come on and talk with you and say, I'm all wrong. But this is totally what I see and totally a simple take on all of this attachment style stuff. Subconsciously, you want what you had. Yeah. Subconsciously, you want what was familiar to you. It's in your bones, it's in the cells of your body. You are led to that. If your mother was um, depressed, you likely took care of her in an emotional way, and you are therefore or instinctively a caretaker for men, because that is what the love passing between you felt like. So as soon as you catch that, right, consciously, the idea is to make as much of the unconscious conscious as possible. So if you can keep track of these moments when you feel drawn to do this and you catch it and you go, whoa, I feel drawn to, you know, licking his wounds, essentially, to making him safe, even though I'm feeling, I'm just shutting off what I'm feeling. If you catch that, you go, whoa, and you step back and go, what am I feeling before I reach out to him? What am I feeling? What's going on? And you will find a treasure trove there of subconscious stuff and conscious stuff and et cetera. So he needs to find that too, but he's not as deep as you are. I tend to think men operate in a much more superficial way than we women do. I, I tend to think that they are trained and they are built to operate on a more mental level and they are not very interested in going deep inside themselves. And thank goodness for that, right? So they can hold the space for us to be deep. I mean, that is what the, the combination of masculine and feminine is. So the way to get him past his wounds then and past the death and past everything is to help him make things conscious, which is sharing you making things conscious. So you make conscious, whoa, I felt the need to run over and, and pat you in the head. And I thought that was so, uh, the whole thing. And then I realized, oh my God, I remember I used to do that with my little brother. You know, I used to feel the need to take, take care of him. Wow, I must have felt really lonely. I feel this, I feel that. And he'll go, yeah. And then he may start, parsing his own background. And before you know it, you're laughing and you're playing uh, Scrabble. And that's how you build a relationship. And that's how you build a sanctuary. You share stuff with each other and it feels good. If you're with a man who's just always sharing stuff, you know that he is way not 
considering you. He's just thinking of you as a safe space because you have created that safe space, but you haven't shared your deed for a safe space as well. This is so amazing and everyone is loving it. I don't know if you can see these, Rory, but Tiffany says, oh, this is so interesting. <laughs> Melissa says, this is so amazing. Wow. Lots of aha moments. Thank you so much. Emily has a good question. She says, does this apply to super practical things? Like if a man's mom fed him delicious food and I hate cooking, he won't be as interested in me. What are your thoughts on that, Rory? Well, as a dyed in the wool, not cook. <laughs> <laughs> And not even eating at the same time together person. Uh, my mother fed us every night. She fed us. But you know what? My mother hated doing it. I knew she hated doing it. And she said she didn't like doing it. But she did it. Now you can see all the complexity of that, right? Yeah. So I could have gone either way. I could have gone enjoying cooking. I liked to bake. I'm a creative person. Or I could go on not to cooking. I went very interesting. Uh, food became a, a, a health issue for me. That that's that's what came down for me. I hate cooking and providing for my family, but I'm doing it because I'm a good mother. Right? What else could she do? My father wasn't gonna. We were too young. So. So to answer the question, I almost want to ask you. Tell me. If, if his mother gave him goodies all the time, and most men, by the way, there's a saying, uh, all men need is sex and a sandwich. <laughs> a man is happy with sex and a sandwich. So you give him sex and you give him a sandwich and he's happy. And you know something, it's true. But the thing is, as soon as you feel like, oh, I'm going to take care of him and give him a sandwich and make him a really nice sandwich and, and make him a cake, because that's what his mother did. We've completely lost the whole thing. Yes. Oh, if we yes. make ourselves a sandwich and throw him a sandwich, literally throw it on a plate, literally throw the plate at him. Yes, we're good. Yeah, he's good with that. But we're all caretaking, you know. Oh, I'm going to make him uh, this meal because his mother did. Now we're in strategy. Now we're in masculine energy. We're absolutely not. We're doing what my mother did. We're doing, we're trying to get a, a result by doing something. As soon as you try to get a result by doing something, you lost. So what you need to do is find out what you want to do. A lot of women like to cook. If I had not experienced that cooking made you feel terrible, that cooking made you feel like you're doing something that you don't want to do, I might have enjoyed recipes and cooking because I love making things. Uh, instead, I'm afraid of fire. I'm afraid of stoves. A very interesting. So instead of trying to overcome your own stuff to make him happy, how about you first find out what you want to do? Do you want to make yourself a really nice salad? Well, then make enough for both of you. Or do you want to order in? Or do you want to not do anything with it? What is it you want? And why don't you want it? And I don't really say forget the why. You can't fix the why. But here you might go, um, yeah, for what reason do I not want to make something? It just doesn't feel good. I'd rather uh, watch TV or I'd rather read that book. Well, that's a pretty awesome catch, right? I want to do that, not this. So why do this? Because you think his mother did it and he would appreciate it. He He's not going to feel happy for the sandwich. He's going to feel your unhappiness, just like I felt my mother's. Mm. So you have to know where you're coming from before you start giving stuff to him. Oh, yeah. Because that, men can read yeah. it a mile away that you want something from them. Ooh, they will run. Ooh, she <laughs> wants something from me. The sandwich has a price tag on it. Ooh. If he asks you for a back rub, he's asking you for something, right? Now yeah, go over and say, sure. That's a whole different thing. If he says, can you make me something to eat? Make him something to eat. Can you feel the difference? Absolutely. And I was kind of laughing over here because that just applies across the board to anything we're trying to do because deep down we're trying to make him see us as the one, which I think this question actually brings up a really good point. You talked about pheromones and so much of this is outside of our control. Are there specific things women can do or not do? Or is it just that you are either like his mother and not like his mother in this 
perfect combination of ways or not. And there's not much you can do about it. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Experts might have a different opinion. There are probably whole books about it. In my opinion, that's what love at first sight is. That's why he, men are really easy. There, there can be a room, if you've watched these reality shows and The Bachelors and all that stuff, 25 women in a room, a man does not go like we women do. Oh, that man's good. That man's good. Oh, I like, they go, boom, that woman. Mm -hmm. They, 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 it's like beeline to that woman from the beginning, the way she moves, the way she looks. And that's his subconscious. Can't do anything about it. After dating that woman for a while, he might decide, nope, doesn't have the other qualities. But the first attraction is that. So that's what, that's why he asks you on a date from seeing your picture on Tinder. That's what makes him ask you on a second date after, uh, you know, seeing you for coffee. That is, that is the attraction. And I know we want, well, sometimes we'll talk about sex early or late, which when you should wait, when you should not, how, how long it takes for a man to get into gear. Theoretically, it takes them a few months to, to find out who you are and whether or not he really wants to be with you and for you to find out who he really is, that where the kind of the patinas come off. And, um, he, he carries though that attraction for quite a long period of time. Men can carry that attraction with them for a long time. And yes, if you have sex with them right away, you can amp that attraction up, but it's not going to have any effect one way or another on what he's building with you. Right. I'm, I'm big on the only person that having sex too quickly can hurt is you. If you get attached and all of a sudden you start not being aware of what's going on. And most of us women have a hard time you know, finding our real emotional selves when we feel emotionally attached to a man. So that's, that's one good reason to wait, but it certainly makes no difference to him. Absolutely not. So he's going to hold on to that attraction. The attraction is the pheromones, right? So if you can build a relationship after that attraction, you know, you're home free. You, the pheromones will always stay. And you've built a relationship with him where he feels good around you and it all makes sense. And the conscious parts of him start to make the relationship. How about we talk about it this way? The unconscious parts of him are what's attracted to you. Little mother, a little not mother, a combination that you have no control over, absolutely can't do anything. So maybe wear a different colors, wear your hair a certain way, wear a lot of makeup, no makeup. I guess you know what he likes though. He'll, he'll you'll be able to tell what he likes and you're going to automatically do what he likes. Right? So that's easy. What you want to do is just not, not stress over that. You know, if, if the pheromones are working, he doesn't care what you're wearing, what you're doing, what perfume you wear, whatever. He's just going, and I, I advise against perfume because the way you really smell is what's going to bring the pheromones into order. On the other hand, you know, wearing cologne, my uh, perfume might be like her perfume, in which case it could be a total loss for you or a win, mm -hmm. but you can't lose with your own scent. You can't lose with that. So he's, he's already pheromonally attracted to you. All you need to do is learn from Helena and about how to be with him and the most authentic, deep, emotional, true way possible. And to always feel respect for him as a human being. And if he's not treating you well, I say, have respect for him. Just go away. When you start feeling cranky and mad at a man, you know, there's something going on inside you. And that's when you need to go deeper inside. Why am I feeling cranky? Why am I want to be mad at him? Being mad at a man for not being what you want him to be is just, it's makes no sense at all. And if you really ask yourself that, you'll just laugh. You go, oh my God, he's not the person I want him to be. Why am I mad at him? Ha! <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> I'm not, I, I, he's not build a bear. I'm not going to make him a better, the man I want him to be. Not going to happen. I'm not going to make a man who does not care much about money into a, a rich guy. I'm not going to make a man who doesn't dress well into a good dresser. Not going to happen. Yeah. 
He said, just forget about it. So let his pheromones make you feel relaxed. Make his attract, let his attraction make you feel relaxed. What you want to do is not kill the attraction by um, turning into his mother in a conscious way. How's that? <laughs> mm. Oh, that's so good. So it sounds like I'm hearing you say is part of this is not under your control. So don't try to make a guy who is just clearly not feeling it for you. Doesn't beeline right to you. Don't try and do these things to like turn yourself into this person that he wants. It's just not going to happen. Um, but part of this is absolutely under your control. And I think that was this third piece that you touched on at the beginning, which is basically everything you talk about, right? Feminine energy, vulnerability, going deep within yourself. I know we're coming up to the end of the hour, but this is probably yes. a topic for a whole other episode. But I would love to hear if you have any quick words of wisdom on what you can do, what you do have control over. Uh, well, the first thing I'm reading um, a, a great question here about how my brother complains about how my mom never made meals and he's dating yeah. a girl who cooks him meals and he loves that about her. Don't believe him. He's saying that. I don't believe any of that. Interesting. Number one. Number two, what he's got is a woman who likes to cook. Unlike his mother. She likes to cook and she gives him meals. That is possibly the beginning of a sanctuary relationship where he actually picked a girl that he likes what she likes. They have something in common. She likes to cook, he likes to eat it, okay? That is way past the mom thing. It has nothing to do with the mom. He, he didn't like not having food with his mom, but boy, he likes food. But if she did not want to cook, but she did it anyway, oh my God, he would be running. He would be out of there tomorrow. He likes that she likes it. Not the, He likes the food, that's nice, but he likes that she likes it. So now we're into relationship building. So if this woman is just doing it, that's they're not gonna last. Not Absolutely. gonna last, she's, she's gonna be a part-time girlfriend who cooks. She's gonna be, uh, when I, I read, I watched a great, uh, video of Tyler Perry doing Medea talking about, um, all of this. It's so true. Uh, yeah. Jessica says big difference. I can feel the difference. It's one to like, oh, I need to do this for him because his mother didn't do this for him. So I need to step in and, you know, fill that void versus like what you said. This is something I like to do. I like to cook and here throw some his way if he's around. Very different. It's like he's being drawn into her feminine joy and her experience rather than a pushing outward. I'm going to do this for him because that'll make him see me as a great partner. Right. Exactly. I mean, how many men have you heard of who have changed their lives because of a good woman? I've mm -hmm. seen that happen a gazillion times. I've seen uh, drunks, men with deep wounds. Um, I had a friend who I was just crazy about him. He was a Vietnam vet. He was a helicopter, helicopter flyer. And you better believe he was deeply wounded, deeply, 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 deeply wounded. And I was not the girl for him. I was crazy about him, but I knew I was not the girl for him. I was not that woman who who would be what he needed. And many years later, I kind of got in touch with people around him. And uh, and I went to a, a show. It was a theater group. And the woman he was with was there. And she was that woman. He stopped drinking around her. They made a life together. She was She wasn't trying to get him to stop drinking so that he would be with her. She could not have cared. It wasn't in her DNA. She was just like, hey, you want to be with me? Stop drinking. Mm. And she was, I wasn't that woman. And it's, it's like that for everything. You may not be the right woman for this man you think you want because he's not the right man for you. This man yeah. is not the right man for me. Forget about me being the right, I could, I was a chameleon. I could have been the right woman for anybody, but he wasn't right for me. That wasn't where I wanted my life to be. I wanted my life to be where I am now. I wanted a partner like my husband that I have now who, you know, supports my every move 
and doesn't require me um, solving his wounds because that is not who I am. That's not what I want to do. So was that helpful? I mean, oh, wanting, yeah. wounds, wanting to heal a wounded man is like, are you sure? Are you sure that that's what you want? Or yeah, you want to heal this wounded man so that he can help you heal your wounds. Well, that's kind of a lovely thing. So start with your wounds and see his capabilities. Wow. I hope that was kind of the end. Oh, my goodness. Yes, she wrote back in. That makes sense. I've just always heard the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. So I was just curious if that was coming into play. What a great question. Yeah, that's something we hear all the time, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. true in a very superficial way. But believe me, men are reading you not superficially. They're, they're reading you on such a deep level, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no point in pretending. They're very sensitive to this vibe we give off. They can tell if we're going against what we truly want just to make something happen with him, right? Absolutely. You just put it in a nutshell. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing, Rory. The time just flew by. I would love to do so many more of these with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Was this fun for you? It's it's one of the things I really enjoy in my life now, Helena. Looking awesome. forward to talking with you. This is, you know, it's not about any of the other things you would think it's about. It's just about talking with a, a girlfriend about things that are really important to you. And that's Absolutely. what I feel. Oh, I mean, who else goodness. can hear me but you, really? All of you ladies, who else can hear me? Talk to the walls? Talk <laughs> to average people on the street? No. You care about hearing. I've. It's back and forth. We are all feeling your energy out there. We're all feeling it. Helena and I are totally getting fed by your energy the way you're getting fed by us. It's a, a really lovely party. So true. That's why I've been loving doing these episodes live. It's just a totally different energy connecting with all the amazing ladies out there. So I hope we can do this again. And yeah, for everyone watching live on Bullhorn, it, the link is on the screen right now to join Rory's Feminine Energy Workshop, where you can work with her brilliant trained coaches for only $17, just a one-time payment of $17. Anything else you want to say on that, Rory? If, uh, by the way, if you're listening to the replay on Spotify or Apple or anywhere else, that will be the first link in the episode details. Just thank you all for being here. I had so much fun. And anytime you want to come to any of my programs, I will remember you. If you tell me where you came across me, I I care about you. I truly, truly, truly do. It's almost though I can see you. And I know that you see into me. I know that me being fake in any way, shape, or form is absolutely not going to help anyone. Oh, I love that. I feel the exact same way. So this was so much fun, Rory. Thank you so much again. Thank you for everyone listening live. And if you're listening to the replay of this on Spotify or Apple, or like I mentioned, anywhere else you listen to podcasts, if you'd like to join us live or join me live for my live podcast recordings, my live broadcast, I'll include a link to download the Bullhorn app in the description as well. So you can join and ask your questions and talk to us personally. It's totally free. It's so easy. You're going to love it. So I'll include that link as well. So Rory, thank you so much again. And I hope to talk with you all again very soon.